Welcome back to the... No, it's not called that anymore. Let me stop that, that again. Welcome back, everyone. This is Paulette Rigo on the Better Divorce Podcast. I am thrilled because you're going to laugh a lot. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to have fun because my guest today, Navi Bliss, I just love her name. I mean, if my last name was Bliss, I would be blissed out too. You're going to love her because she's incredibly goofy and silly and she has the loudest, most infectious laugh I've heard in a long time. But she also cries on a dime, both happy and sad. Like cute kittens on a heartwarming commercial. Welcome to the podcast, Navi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to be here with you and your amazing audience. It's an honor. Well, as most people know, I've had this podcast for five years. It was a bit of a dare. Thank you, Elizabeth. I renamed it in August, though. So now it's the Better Divorce Podcast. It makes so much more sense. Better Divorce Academy, Better Divorce Blueprint, Better Divorce Blog, Better Divorce Retreats, Better Divorce Podcast. Does everyone see a theme here? Please, you know, we're, we're good. It makes so much more sense, but this is a place where people can come to meet other people who have gone through divorce and have a story to share of inspiration, empowerment, and key takeaways. Because when I was going through my eight and a half year divorce, man, did I need inspiration, as well as professionals that can help them learn what not to do and what to do so that they can divorce with grace and dignity and wisdom. So let's dive in. I want to tell everybody a tiny bit about, about you. Navi is a demystifier. Ooh, of personal relationships, a cultivator of confidence, and don't we all need that? A certified love and relationship coach, a certified inspirational speaker, and the host of the Blissful Love Podcast. So without further ado, why do you do this work? Tell us a little bit about your story and what makes you want to help people with their relationships because we all need it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think what gets us all into this work um, is the fact that I struggled with my own relationships. So I actually grew up in a home with a mom that was physically and emotionally abusive towards me. So I grew up without any self-love, without any confidence. It wasn't something that I had at one point in my life and I lost it. I, it, I just never, I never had it. Mm -hmm. And um, that led me into a place where I was constantly seeking it outside of myself. All I wanted was someone to love me. I wanted that validation of my existence. And of course, that led me in a path of unhealthy relationships. And um, I was previously married. And when I met my husband, there was somebody who was willing to love me. And all of a sudden, I thought, okay, this is it. Now, um, you know, this proves that I'm worthy of love. And um, I felt elated at that. And um, that marriage did not work out. Um, he had a child with somebody else while we were married. And um, when that marriage ended, it set my self-esteem into an even lower place than it had been, which I didn't think it could be lower because I probably started at you know, negative 100 and went down to negative 200 because, you know, the proof that I was looking for that I was lovable, you know, now I had the opposite proof. So it was reinforcing the point that I, that I wasn't lovable. And then that led me into a place where I went to even more toxic relationships, abusive relationships. And after I got out of the second one by the skin of my teeth, um, I just realized that could never happen to me again because I wasn't responsible for what had gone on in the past, but I wasn't a child anymore. And I was responsible for what I was allowing into my life now. And I needed to change that. I had to figure out what was going on. And that sent me to a healing journey myself um, that included a lot of self-work, included therapy, and then it included coaching because I was really ready to to move past this and, and create a new version of myself. And through that, when I actually 
got to this place where I did love myself, where I woke up every single day and I, I felt good in my own skin. It, it felt like a miracle because I didn't know that was possible because I hadn't had that up until that point in my life. And I realized how many other people are struggling just like me and that um, are in that place where they just want love and validation and they're going into relationships or clinging to relationships that aren't working because they don't think that they're worth anything on their own, right? So even if they're in a dysfunctional relationship, they'd rather stay in that dysfunctional relationship than be alone. And um, that is when I became really passionate about helping other people um, build their confidence so that they can have those healthy relationships and magnetize the right people to them. And, and just most importantly, really learn to love themselves and feel good in their own skin. Thank you so much for taking the risk in sharing your story. I know we didn't get into it deeply about your childhood and your relationship with your mom and showing that that preliminary early relationship in many ways, and I'm not finger pointing or blaming, you know, at this point, we're all adults, but it, it clearly demonstrates that foundation was laid for you as a young child getting into your teen years and your young womanhood, how it laid a foundation of you getting into abusive relationships. And it's common. I want everyone to realize, join the club. It happens a lot. We don't just say, oh, I had a abusive uh childhood or job or boss or family member or whatever the situation is, everyone's different. And I've identified it. I'm over it. And that'll never happen again. Like we have these little conversations in our head and it's so common. And I know if you're li listening on the audio, you don't get to see this woman, her eyes sparkle. Her skin is, is illuminous. Her teeth are so white. I need to get my shades. She's just a, like glows and she um, emits such positivity and uh, she illuminates. That's just the word. I, I don't know what their word. Help me out, Navi, if you have a better one. But so to show that I would love to have seen a picture of you as a child. Were you the ch kind of child that hid the pain and well, or were you bubbly always? I would say that I was bubbly always. Um, it's just that I didn't um, see myself that way, right? And I actually had such body dysmorphia until I actually healed my relationship with myself because I always saw myself as uh, unattractive, overweight, all of these things. And like, I, I actually wasn't, right? And it wasn't until I was able to go back and look at pictures of myself as a child, as an adult, and realize that all of those things they were never true that like they they were never my truth right that that was that was my mother's trauma that she had that she had dumped on me right mm -hmm. and then going into the the place of ending up in those abusive relationships because the trauma that i'd experienced in my childhood was so terrible i actually didn't recognize those relationships as abusive until later because mm -hmm. It, because I was, I knew that it didn't feel right in my bones. It didn't feel right when something isn't right in your bones, you know, that it's not right. Right. There's that little voice inside of you. That's always telling you that it's not right. But rationally, logically, I was thinking this wasn't as bad as I've experienced before. So it's not really that bad, mm. but that wasn't true. <laughs> Beautiful point. And you spoke a little bit about the tipping point. That was my term or your awakening or the door opened where you just sort of put your foot down and said, where you announced to yourself, I don't know if anyone else was in the room with you. I, I can't do, I can't take this anymore. This is enough. Enough is enough is enough. Where did that strength or awareness come from? Yeah. So when I was talking about that little voice, we all have that little voice, right? And it's kind of starts as a whisper inside of you. Right. When you're in a situation that where you're not being treated well, that is not OK. And it keeps getting louder and louder and louder until it's screaming at you, that little voice. And I call that your your higher self or, you know, that 
but that it's like that part of spirit that you're tapped into. Right. Mm -hmm. And it, it kept growing louder and louder. And I was in these moments and I was in these situations and um, how that second abusive relationship that I was in ended. Um, it, it was, it was grace. Um, he, he'd ended up moving, um, to another continent for work. And so I was able to leave. And that voice at that point was screaming at me because this can never happen again. Because if, that hadn't happened. I don't actually know how I would have disentangled and walked away from that relationship because it, leaving an abusive relationship is very, very complicated and it's very, very dangerous, actually. Um, and that's the most dangerous um, time, actually, is when you're trying to leave because that person doesn't want you to leave. And being able to um, to step away, that voice was just, it was screaming. It had gotten so loud after enduring so much for so long that it, that was that was my inner voice screaming. And, and I know that if someone is listening to this and they're contemplating, they're in a relationship and they're contemplating leaving that relationship, it's because that inner voice is getting louder and louder. Mm. I do speak to a lot of clients or people when they're first finding me depending on the stage of them uh, either contemplating divorce themselves or their spouse has been hinting at it, throwing out the D word, threatening, right? All those sort of like, why don't we just get divorced? Or, uh, you know, if you could do that one more time, I'm just going to divorce you. Or I'm, I'm sure everybody, you know, is here, all of those threats. Now, typically, both people make threats at some point during when the marriage gets contentious, right? When there's that feeling of like, oh, I can't live in this anymore. It's so painful. And there's a little bit of teasing or taunting or threatening, usually by one side, sometimes the other. But many times I hear from people coming to me, I have been thinking about this for two years, five years, 10 years. I've heard up to 20. Why do you think that is, that that contemplation period, of course, it's different one, different for everyone, but why do you think it's so long? I think it's so long. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing that it's so long, but I, I think that marriage is uh, something that people enter into with the belief that it is going to last forever. I don't think that most people enter into marriage willy nilly, right? And you are very entangled with that person and getting divorced is not simple. Even, you know, if you put all the emotional stuff as aside from a legal standpoint is not simple, right? right? And then a lot of times when it comes to women, you've given up your career, you've given up so many things and you think, okay, can I, do I even have the capacity to do this on your own? there's still a, sto social, a social stigma that's attached to getting divorced. I mean, it's getting better, but it is still absolutely there. Yeah. But I also think like one of the biggest points is, is when you don't believe in your worth, there is like society places more worth on couples. So you, pl you place worth on being in a relationship, on in being in a couple, more than you do on your own happiness. You're choosing a relationship over your own happiness because your sense of worth is so low that, okay, whatever social status, whatever little bit of validation I get from being in this relationship is better than nothing. Mm. Ain't that the truth? You talk a bit or you share the work that you do uh, with relationship coaching or self-empowerment, self-love coaching. You have this mission to help people fall head over heels in love with themselves so that they can effortlessly attract the life and the love they deserve. That is a tall order. I commend you for that. I don't do that work because I'm in the trenches of private mediation. No, no um, plaintiff, no defendant, no lawsuit, no court. Like it's all about alternative dispute resolution. We just need to keep moving forward in that. Or I'm helping one of the parties get through a high conflict, high asset, contentious divorce. But many a time there are high conflict people and they have been beaten down, insulted, 
controlled, abused, manipulated, lied to, and their self-confidence is about this big. That's a tiny little measurement if you're listening. And yes, there is a responsibility that I have and other professionals in the divorce world to have them feel strong and courageous and prepared and organized and researched and all of those other practical things. And yes, the emotional part is a lot of that too. But we're talking about some deep inner work of when you're, when you're using the phrase falling back in love with yourself or for some people falling in love with themselves, they may never have understood that concept. So for those listening or somebody that's out there that's struggling with this, please share your wisdom, some maybe key ideas or little gems that they can identify with. What does that look like? And where do you start when someone comes to you and they feel beaten down and don't have that ability to love themselves or care for themselves? Yeah, I mean, the first place that I start is always recognizing that that person, that their awareness and their desire to improve, that that is, that's incredible, right? Because a lot of people keep doing the same thing over and over again, and they don't even have an awareness around it, right? But the fact that you have an awareness around it, that means that that change is possible for you, right? And that the fact that you have that desire, that means like now you're ready to to take action towards it. So that's incredible. You're already in this incredible place to, to start with, right? Because somebody who doesn't have that desire, who doesn't have that awareness, then they're they're not ready. They're not in a place where they can move towards that change. So that that's I always like to acknowledge that for people. So someone is listening because sometimes you know when you're, especially if you're listening to all of these like mindset self improvement, all of reading these books, it can be really easy to start beating yourself up because you start recognizing all of the things that you're doing wrong. But you don't know what you don't know until you know it, right? So you can't beat yourself up for that. And the fact that you're open and willing to change, this can happen at any point in your life. And if you've never loved yourself, I never loved myself until I did, right? So it is possible. And it starts in small ways, right? The The biggest way is to, to tap further into that awareness, is to start paying attention to the ways that you're beating yourself up. And you're not going to go from negative 200 to plus 100. That, that isn't going to happen, right? And the reason even that you want to go is because you're you're so, you want that 180 change right away is because you're so unhappy with yourself where you are, right? But as you start to to tap into even little bits of self-love, you're going to start to feel more comfortable. And and then the irony of it is that the change comes faster and easier because you don't need it so badly, right? And so the first thing is is really to tap into what are all of the ways that you're being unkind to yourself? And then start by neutralizing it, right? If you can't say anything good to yourself, if every time you look in the mirror in the morning, you're saying something unkind to yourself, can you just breathe and remind yourself that that isn't a kind way to speak to somebody and you wouldn't speak to another person that way. So you shouldn't do that to yourself, even Mm -hmm. if you can't switch it around and say something positive, right? Those awareness, because so much of what we do, those neural pathways are carved into our brain, right? And that's the easiest. It's a habit. It's on a loop. And as soon as we create a pattern interrupt for that loop, we can start to break that loop. So just those moments of awareness to start can be incredibly powerful. And as you start to do that, then there's so many other things that you can um, add in. Like there's a lot of nervous system regulation work that I do with people um, and then rewiring. But But the very, very first basic step is always just the awareness. And, you know, in those moments you catch yourself. If you can stop yourself, even if you're only aware, like let's just say 25% of the time and you stop yourself in the track 25% of the time, that's naturally going to grow because your awareness is going to start to grow and you start to neutralize that. Then you're starting to uh, open up the possibility to add in positive things. Mm. You bring up such a good point where we speak to total strangers, the checkout person at the grocery store someone that opens their door for you when you stop to get coffee or just 
I don't just walking down the street and we say, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Or how was your day? Or thank you very much. And we just have, well, most people are polite to other people, but I know it's a generalization, but we generally are kind and cordial and respectful to strangers. But the thoughts and the words in our own head that we ruminate and it's on a loop where I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not whatever your list is of complaints. It, it it's it's helpful sometimes for in my world when people come to me. I just let them emotionally vomit. I just let them, you know, blah, get it all out and just piss in vinegar as my grandmother used to say, right? Just get it out, get it out, get it out. And then I look them in the eye and I say, now, now, I don't want to hear any of that crap again. Okay. It's over. Those days are gone. We'll put that over on the side, can journal that, uh, analyze it. Uh, but right now we're, we're going to move forward and I want you to look in the mirror and feel good about where you are, the decisions that you've made to get where you are at this moment. And hey, just the fact that you found me, right? The fact that you found Navi, you found me, means something is working. You have taken the first step towards identifying that you deserve better, that you are worthy, and you do have a birthright to live your very best life. Never forget that. Now, you have co-authored or been a contributing author to two books, and I love the names, Our Yellow Brick Road. What the heck is that? I want to hear about this book, Our Yellow Brick Road, and what is it that you contributed? Yeah, so that was actually um, a passion project with myself and 10 other inspirational speakers. And I, I use the word inspirational speaker because... I see a difference between an inspirational speaker and a motivational speaker. A motivational speaker is someone who's pointing the finger and going, rah, 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 you can do it. An inspirational speaker is sharing their story, their humanity, and allowing you to tap into it so that you know that if that person can do it because they're not any better than you, they're not any different than you, that you have the capacity to do it as well, right? Nice. And that's what I aim to do, and that's what the speaker's in that book aimed to do. And we took some of our most powerful speeches that we've shared on stage that really created an impact and we, um, we weave them into uh, a book together. So that is some of my, um, most, uh, inspiring speeches that have been weaved into one chapter in that book. <laughs> Perfect. So seeing that you, <clears throat> excuse me, um, left the the past behind with the abusive childhood and the abusive um unhappy marriage where are you now with your work and your mission and where how do you want to look back at the the work that you're doing now 5 or 10 years from now what is what is it that you're really hoping to accomplish by helping others yeah i mean i just want to create a better world i think that you know <clears throat> I think that people are also afraid of confidence. They're afraid of loving themselves because they're afraid to be um, egotistical and they're afraid to be arrogant. But I'll tell mm -hmm. you how I separate arrogance and, and confidence. Um, so arrogance actually is still coming from a place of insecurity and you're still comparing yourself to everyone. You might be saying that you're better than everyone, but you're comparing yourself to everyone, right? And the gift of confidence, what confidence allows you to do and why I don't think you can ever be too confident is when you are fully confident, it allows you to be fully present in the moment because an arrogant person walks into a room and they might think how they're better than everyone else. A confident person walks into a room and they're focused on being present and connecting with every single person because there is no comparison. They're not thinking they're better than anyone else. They're not thinking that they're worse than anyone else. And this is how it allows you to magnetize relationships and create connections in your life because you're sitting in front of people and you're connecting with them. You're fully fully present in that moment with them. You are listening to that conversation. You are engaging in that conversation. You are not there trying to compare yourself, thinking how you're better than that person, right? And 
And I believe that when people can show up in their confidence in the world, we all have this incredible work that we're meant to do, all of us, all different things, right? And it's our lack of belief in ourselves that holds us back from putting ourselves out there, from experiencing life the way that we want to do. So when I look back on my work, I want to know that I helped as many people as I could to step out in their bold audacity and do everything that they were meant to do in this world. And that includes being loved the way they're meant to be loved. Mm. Admirable and some, some work that's very well needed. You bring up a good point, Navi, about being fully present. It's extremely difficult for people to do that now. There's too many distractions. There's always a shiny object uh, flying before their face, right? It's just a bombardment of stimulus. From the moment you wake up, with uh, whether you get up naturally an alarm clock, even the alarm clock is, eh, eh, you know, whatever your alarm clock noise is. That was probably one from my teenagehood years. It's a stimulus and you are bombarded with everything you see and taste and smell and hear and feel 24 seven. Even when you sleep, there's dreams and you're, you're having this stimulus, even when you're sleeping, it's very difficult for people to, to dial down and withdraw from all the constant bombardment of stimulus from the external world. And I believe that the internal love and the internal confidence and the internal self-awareness comes exactly from their inside. Instead of the internet, it's the internet. It's where you feel the greatest sense of connection to self. And you need to find something that helps you reconnect to self, simplifying your life, look around your environment. Maybe it's too colorful or too busy or too loud, too messy. You've got too much stuff. And dialing down all the electronics, it's hard. I find everyone is guilty of it now. Even those times we try to go out to dinner and have a conversation with one person or another couple, it's so tempting to look around or watch TV or whip out your phone and check your email or have a, you know, not really being present and comparing yourself to other people stems from looking at other things, right? Whereas if I'm just talking like you and I right now, I'm with you, you're with me, nothing else matters. And that's a a rarity in this world. I see money, many relationships, including parental ones, go off the rails because parents are not taking the time for the children. And the children in turn, turn learn, well, if mom and dad aren't present for me, hell, I don't need to be present for anybody else. They don't actually say that with their mouth, but that's the message they're getting. They see it in school. They see it on TV. They see it on social media. It's all over the place. So do yourself a favor. Listen to what Navi is saying. Be in the moment. Yeah, and there's no anxiety in the moment either, right? Anxiety comes from being in all, trying to be in all of these different places, future Mm -hmm. tripping, thinking about the past. When you're in the moment, right? That's why, I mean, the easiest thing you can actually do to, to center yourself is you can like a touch a part of your body, right? Like put place one hand on top of the other hand, even, and just stroke like the top of, um, top, top of your hand that will bring you back into the moment. If you focus on that situation, right? If you find yourself straying, there's all like, or if you're holding an object in your hand, you, if you focus on that object, focus on the touch, these little things you can do to start centering yourself and bringing yourself just into the moment focused on exactly where you are. And you'll notice that anxiety will start to melt away because, you know, if you're focused on that sensation of, you know, one hand touching the other hand, that is not, there's no anxiety with that. Mm. I have my clients bring a little rock or a stone that's smooth and pretty and shiny and hold it in their hand so that 
it's something grounding and firm and stable and secure. And they can, nobody knows they're doing it. It's not like bringing a boulder, but it's just, you know, like, I don't know, yay big, right? Like two inches. And it just, it's soothing and grounding. And they feel that, like you said, you know, touching something, right? You, connecting to your senses, the breath, right? Like really listening to the sounds and the environment. And then what, like looking at the colors as if you'd never see again. And you had to close your eyes and describe something, you know, almost pretend if you were deaf or blind and you lost your senses, how much of a different world that would be. We're so blessed to have the ability to taste and touch and see and hear and feel. It's remarkable what we take for granted. The thing that helped me the most was minimizing my environment when I was coming out of a very uh, combative and stressful job and marriage. I wanted everything to just be super calm. <laughs> Not always possible when you're raising teenagers, but it really helped me uh, lower my adrenal stress and the cortisol and go from sympathetic to parasympathetic nervous system, pranayama, breath work, meditation, yoga, particularly restorative and yin yoga. It, whatever you need to do, take a walk, pet a dog or a cat, go out in nature, draw a picture, write a poem, call a friend, whatever you need to do to stay present and not think about the past, which tends to lead to depression, and the future, which tends to lead into anxiety. When you're right in the moment, those two worlds dissipate. So excellent. But I want everyone to know about your group coaching program called Sexy Confidence launching in December. What is that? Because I think we all need it. Yeah. So um, this is my signature group coaching program. So I normally run this um, a few times a year. I have a lot of projects that I'm working on. So it, it's only a few times a year that I run this program. It is six weeks. And this is a program to help you step into your sexiest, most confident, radiant self. And it is a program that includes um, pre-recorded modules. And we have live coaching in there. And the group aspect is really great because it helps you build momentum and whatever you're going through, there's other people going through it and someone might be a step behind, someone might be a step ahead of you, but you get to learn from the other people that are in the group because that person that's a step ahead of you, they might be helping you on the next step of your journey because you don't know that question to ask. You don't even know that you needed to know that until you hear it, right? And so um, it's just it's just a great time. Um, and I know that uh, everyone that has done it is a big fan. They leave just feeling fantastic. And um, I'm launching it in December because, you know, this is the time of year when you can feel overwhelmed, when you can feel stressed and you know, um, and a lot of people want to wait until the new year. And, and the thing is feeling good. It starts now. You don't have to make this, this resolution to, um, to look different or have a different body. How about just feeling fantastic? And then all of those other things will come to you more easily and seamlessly as well. Mm, manifesting it in the moment. And what, a better way to wrap up our conversation than when you're going through divorce. Confidence is key. I like to call it strength and resilience too. You can label it however you want, but that moment where you feel like I got this, I know what I'm doing. I deserve the best and I'm going to move forward wisely. Thank you for this. Tell everybody the best way to find you, work with you, learn about you, follow you, hang out with you. What's the best way? Yeah, absolutely. So you can connect with me through my website, which is NavyBlissCoaching.com. I'm also on all social media, just at NavyBliss. And please feel free to DM me, reach out with, reach out to me. I love connecting with people and having conversations. If you have questions about my programs or you just, you just want to talk, you have something to share. Please don't be afraid to uh, reach out to me. I also, um, 
I have a, a, a book, a memoir, a teaching memoir, where I'm actually going to be going in depth and sharing the details of my personal story and all of the steps that I took to overcome it. So that is coming out in April. It is called Broken to Blissful. So if, um, if, you're thinking, okay, I'm going through a divorce. I'm, I'm, I'm in the, you know, throes of all of this trouble. I do not have the resources to devote to coaching and support. Then, then this book is going to be something for you. It is something that I wanted to create as uh, an affordable resource that would help anyone that is struggling to be able to pull themselves out of it. Mm, we all need resources and tools, everything from, uh, a deck of cards to a book, a workbook, uh, an audio book, a podcast, a blog. It doesn't have to be five years worth of one-on-one -on -one coaching, everyone. You know, try to find little things. Books were transformational for me. I had and have a library of so many resources. Thank you for this. And to everybody, you really do have a future ahead of you, no matter how dark, painful, uncomfortable it is. If Navi can get out of it and Paulette can get out of it, so can you. Reach out to us, follow us. We'll talk to you soon. And until next time, have a better, better outcome.